Praise God. This is Judah Adkins. Uh, this program is HowBigIsGod.org. And I'm so glad that you came, that you come uh, to my program today, and that you're able to uh, to listen. I, uh, I've been studying on this lesson for quite some time, and I believe God has some special answers for you. And I believe that you're going to receive what you need. You know, you need to ask God, what is it that I need more than anything? Because he knows you. And there's certain things we think we, we need. There's certain things we think that um, uh, even spiritually we're not sure uh, we think we need this when actually is something else that we need. And I want to cover a subject today that is so important. I've covered it before, but I just, God has just spoken to my heart about doing this again. And it is, it is, it is vital that we get a hold of these messages in this last hour because it will keep our spirits clear our conscious cl consciousness clear and that we do not have anything plugging up our pipes plugging up the flow of god the life of god in and out of us and so i just want to present to you today i'll be going over some different po points and things but you'll see they will all come together and uh so stay with me and know that um uh, that God is good and that he wants you to receive and believe. He wants you to be able to be free in every area of your life. And there's no place, there's nothing that he won't do for his children. He withholds nothing good, it says, from them who walk uprightly. Those that are constantly looking, seeking, and allowing him to guide them, allowing him to take hold of their lives and to begin to work a work in your life that you, you look back uh, just months ago or even a year ago and you say, oh my goodness, I have grown because you've stayed open to the Spirit of God. You have allowed God to do some things in your life. You're not timid about it anymore. You're not questioning if he wants to. Yes, he wants to. You're not questioning, am I good enough? Yes, if you're born again and a child of God, you are his child and he wants to give you the very best and to him you are tops to him you are his kid and he wants to see you prosper and be blessed in every area if i could just take a little piece of your brain out today and put that message in your brain i think that and even in my brain you know, we we would be able to make leaps and bounds and see amazing things happen in the Lord. I mean, large, thinking largely in the Lord, not allowing anything setting and questioning with all these little uh, silliness that we've allowed in the past. And a lot of us do because we're not studying the word of God. We're still immature. Uh, the body of Christ I hate to say, but it's still so immature in so many areas. Uh, we have pastors in our churches and men and women that um, that are wonderful pastors and men and women. But, but sometimes we all get in a rut and we teach certain things. But God wants the whole council to be taught. It isn't just one little area. We can wear that area out. But it's a full counsel of God. And sometimes this won't work uh, completely, or you may not see completely the fullness. Uh, God is so dimensional. God has so many. I mean, God is so vast and so great. He, When he speaks, oh my goodness, it speaks volumes. It's not just a little bit here. Uh, it's it's volumes and that, that you can begin to leap into and begin to know the depths and the heights height the intimate knowledge of him and to begin to know him in such a measure that you could never imagine 
but when we put things in little small boxes here and boxes there, or we teach just one thing here and one thing there, we miss so much of the vastness. We miss so much of the goodness of the Lord and so much of who he is. Amen? Amen. Well, I tell you today... <clears throat> Right, let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this day. Oh, it's a glorious day. Hallelujah. It's a day that you have given us. Oh, Lord, that you mark this day in our lives. That, Lord, for the anointing, for growth, for prosperity in our spirits. Because when we prosper there, then we prosper in everything. That we see clearly your precepts. That we walk in you like we've never walked before. Lord, let your light shine upon us. Let that life bubble up in us to such a measure. Lord, that we shine like the sun. Lord, that wherever we go, somebody says, you're different. You're different. You are different because you're not of the world. Father, thank you. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for working and willing of your good pleasure. And Lord, that you are great and mighty in all your ways. Hallelujah. Well, our lesson today is... <clears throat> I just want to go through some things and then we'll we'll share uh, a, a subject that is so important. And we see that in Luke 5, Jesus is on the move. He's just come out of the wilderness. He has begun to, uh, he had passed all the tests that the enemy had put on him. And then he went into the, the, synagogue, the synagogue and he took the stroll, it says, and I'm going to be reading a lot out of the Amplified. <laughs> it says, and there was handed to him the, the roll of the book of the prophet Isaiah. He opened and unrolled the book and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me, the anointed one, the Messiah, to preach the good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to announce release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to send forth, deliver those who are oppressed, who are downtrodden, bruised, crushed, and broken down by calamity. Oh, how, how we see that today, that people, societies are broken down by calamity. Then he says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The accepted and acceptable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and free favors of God. I love that free favors of God <laughs> profusely abound. This is the day that they profusely abound if we let them. That we can believe, I mean, with mighty things, great things in him. That we just let our spirits soar. In the name of Jesus to see, but the main thing that we are not here for ourselves, it is for, to see the gospel go forth. That we see it's not my ministry, it's his ministry. That we can see it is him that we're promoting, not people. It said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. He didn't say, I lift up my ministers. He didn't say even to lift up the disciples. He said, you lift my name up and all men will be drawn unto me. And so everything we do, we have to lift Jesus up. It is him that we are serving. It's him, our brother that died for us. That, uh, that loved us so much that he gave us, uh, us his life. And so, therefore, we have to see that he is lifted up. So here he is. He proclaims this, and then he begins to be on the move like never before. And he's got, here he is. <clears throat> it says that uh, he... He ends up borrowing Peter's boat, and he ends up paying him back for it. 
because Peter twirled all night, didn't catch anything. And at that time, we still, we are in the world. We still have bills we've got to pay. Jesus knew that. He knows that today. So Peter had taxes and things that he had to pay. And <clears throat> him and the disciples toiled all night, but they didn't, they couldn't catch a fish. So Jesus borrowed their boat. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. He borrowed their boat and he ministered to the people. Then he told Peter and then he says, throw that net out on the right side of the boat. I believe it was the right side. And they said, well, Master, we toiled all night. And probably when they were tired and saying, basically in the tone of voice, this word pooped, we're tired, we toiled all night and didn't catch a thing. I don't see how this is going to change things. But at your word, we'll do it. So they threw out the net and here come all these fishes. And here he had people, multitude that was watching it. They were witnesses, not one. But many saw this miracle, saw what Jesus did. And so I'm telling you, God wants to show up today. He wants to show people in you and me because we have his life in us. He wants to show up and do great things in our lives and in the lives of those that we witness to the lives of people today. Hallelujah. Then here, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they get a hold of it. And he's spreading the good news abroad. And it says, all of a sudden, people are getting to know him like crazy. And even the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the law, or the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, from every village, from Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, started gathering. And they saw the power of, of the power of God in him to heal the people. And at that, that time, behold, there were some men who brought a man on a stretcher. And here comes a man on a stretcher. And these men are carrying this man. And when they couldn't get to Jesus, what they do? They tear up the man's roof. I mean, that takes some guts to get up on somebody's house and tear up their roof. And then they drop that man down in front of Jesus. And Jesus, I think, to my heart, I think the Jesus that I know, I, I, I tell you so many times, he makes me laugh. And the joy, his joy comes into me. It's just wonderful. I'll look at, I'll begin to read the Bible. And then I start thinking, well, what was his reaction? And I believe that he, he giggled a little. I believe when he saw these men's determination, that joy took hold of him. And that he smiled, I believe. And saw this man sitting, standing there. Here's this crowd of people, Pharisees and Sadducees, all, teachers of the law. And they're all watching him intensely. I mean, they, are, they have their eyes on every move that he's making. And so here, uh, their determination, these men's determination, to see their friend or their relative healed, <clears throat> caused them to tear up that, that person's roof that where Jesus gathered in the Pharisee's house. And so anyways, um, because I believe it was the, uh, a house or home of one of the Pharisees. But anyways, here he was. They dropped the man down. And Jesus looked at them and said, and, and no doubt... These men were determined to get this man healed. Who knows? The man could have hounded him every day. It might be his friends and his brothers. Take me here. Take me there. And they heard that Jesus could heal. And so they began to stretch their faith. And Jesus said, according to your, their faith, this man was healed according to their faith. Isn't that something? And so... Because Jesus said, 
he saw their faith and the, and the Amplified says their confidence in him springing forth. But Jesus used the phrase of the words that stirred the Pharisees and the teachers of the law up. Because he said to the one on the stretcher, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to get all stirred up and saying, who is this man? Uh, and arguing amongst themselves and questioning, this man is speaking blasphemy. Yet people here on the earth forgive one another every day. And this is what I want to talk to you about. We have the ability. Jesus said that we are to forgive one another. And that we have the ability to go to a person and say, you know what? Forgive me for what I have done. Forgive me for what I have said. And the other person has the ability to say, I forgive you. And so we have this ability on earth. But Jesus saw a greater death that forgiveness causes, unforgiveness causes. That we hold in our heart such grievances against some people. That it makes us sick. That we end up becoming depressed. That we end up allowing something to take hold of us. And that person is uh, controlling us. And you don't even realize through what they said and the hurt that come from that. And some people are vicious. Some people can be, you know, they're, they're just wonderful people. But all of a sudden you see this vicious side of them. Because you touched on something maybe that was so tender, something that was such a problem in their life at one time, that they just exploded. Well, because of it, it caused such hurt. And because that person held, then they decided, I'm holding it against you. I am, that was unforgivable. Well, Jesus knows there's nothing unforgivable except for the sin of the, of, of the Holy Ghost. When you mock him, and you say, I mean, there's, we're talking about, you have to deny him. But, and basically, it's people that's walked with him, that know him, that have seen the power of the Holy Ghost, and have pretty much denied, turned around and denied him. So that would be the only sin that could be for, not forgiven. But murderers were forgiven. Paul was forgiven for, for murdering uh, he had people drug out of their houses as Saul, and he had them put in prison. He saw many of them get stoned. Many of them got, they, they were killed. But he ended up having the life of God in him that turned him around. And he had to forgive himself. And no doubt people around him, he had to say, the, forgive me for I knew not what I was doing. And those that already knew Jesus understood that. And Peter and Paul and them began, or Peter and James and, and the other disciples began to accept it because they realized they walked with Jesus. And I believe that they had times that they were upset with one another, said things, hungry maybe, tired, and said cruel things and hurtful things that they, Jesus, um, had shared with them about forgiving because he says, and I believe, you know, Jesus even said, listen, if you bring your gift to the altar or your requests, he says, and you have forgiveness in your heart. He says, you take that. He said, leave it there. And because money doesn't pay your way out of unforgiveness. Money doesn't pay your way. People learn that money does a lot of things. And that they can go, you know, mess over somebody and go right back to the same person. And that same person fall right back down in, into the situation. But they see that their money has taken preeminence in that person and that they'll do anything and they're not concerned if you forget if you forgive them or not. They could care less. They are just abusive. So money, if you want to give your gift to God and make that gift 
be a blessed gift where it can grow in your life and your requests be made known before the Lord and your prayers answered, you have to go you have to go to the person that you have ought against and make sure that you make those things right. Now, if that person, you, you ask them to forgive you, but they don't want to forgive you, then that monkey's on their back and God will deal with them. And I'm telling you, it won't, I mean, it, <clears throat> it won't bode well with them because it's forgiving. We have to forgive one another. People, this man, when he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. This, this man could have been hurt by somebody so badly. Then it went into depression and then it went into affecting his body all over. This is what unforgiveness does. You don't realize it. This is what hurt from somebody else does. And you have to forgive them, even though maybe they don't come back and ask forgiveness. You cannot let that rule your life. I have went to people, they were so bitter and angry, and the silly part of it was, a lot of them couldn't even remember what the, the infraction was. They couldn't remember exactly what it was about. Or that it didn't, when they started talking about it, they seen how silly and foolish they were because it was such a small thing. But even if it's a big thing, you have no idea when you cause someone, when you are, are um, you know, when you hold something against someone and you hurt them so bad and you don't want to forgive them, they could walk, a lot of times they walk out of your house or out of your place, get in an accident. They're so upset emotionally because you hurt them so bad that you said something to them and you were so out of character or you were trying to impress other people or whatever it was. But then the person that, that, this, that uh, spoke those words they end up hurt too because they can't forgive themselves. Look what I caused my friend to get hurt, to be hospitalized, to go. It, it's a dangerous and ugly thing, unforgiveness is. It is a thing that will carry you into places that you don't want to go. I even think, I look at the, the um, I look at the example even of the uh, 10 virgins. And it said five were wise and five were foolish. And, you know, I think about the here, the Lord's coming back and the 10 virgins hear about it and they're headed his way. And all of a sudden, five stop. They quit. Their lamps have went out. What has happened? What is it really talking about? Well, I believe the five virgins that were wise kept a clear conscience, no unforgiveness. They were quick to forgive. They were quick to make things right. They were quick and clear to keep their master. They had no unforgiveness and garbage that plugged up their spiritual pipes, in other words. Their lamps were burning brightly. The fires were burning brightly, their, their uh, flame, I mean. And all of a sudden, you have five that they stop. But what made them stop? Was it because God had dealt with them to go make things right? And because of unforgiveness and because of things in their life, that their lamps begin to blow, the flame began to be lower and lower and lower till it went out. They had no oil. They had no joy. We have pure joy and should have pure joy in our lives. But when we refuse to go make things right, we refuse to do what is right. Then we want to look at somebody, give me oil. Help me to get where I need to go so I can get back and tell that person I'm sorry. Well, no, we cannot do that. So the, that, to me, it seems more that their lamps went out and they didn't have, they couldn't stand before the Lord over it. 
They had time to make things right. People, we have time to make things right now. Some of us have made a mess of things. Some of us have allowed other people to influence us so strongly. And now we're turning on them and we're bitter against them because all of a sudden we see things that have ruined us. We see friends we've lost because we listened to one person that just had to be right. Or we listen to a group of people that it just seems so clear to us at the time that 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 was right. But yet, when we begin, and if you don't stay abreast of the word of God, if you do not know what his word is saying, then your light will flicker. Your flame begins to drop down because it is your spirit is the candle of the Lord. The word of God and the life of God in you, the light of God. And when you're obedient and when you allow yourself to press in to God, it's pressing into God. It's doing our best and utmost every day, not not seeing how we can get around things, not seeing how we can get by with things. It is doing walking in excellence that we desire and want to walk in excellence. A person that will work for you, you might have a factory. You might have some kind of business. You might have offices. And you have one particular person there every day on time. And they're sitting at their desk or at their machine, they were, are working when they're supposed to be working. They are doing an excellent job because they're not trying to please the man so much, even though they know and are wise. Because when we give our best, people know it. And they want to promote you. But more so, God wants to promote you. God wants to see you, he'll say, come up higher because he sees your heart. He sees that you're not just just throwing things out there. He, he sees that you're not just there, uh, just doing it because you have to do it and it's a duty or whatever. No, but you're doing it with as unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we have people here on earth to forget. We we forgive one another. But when Jesus said, I forgive you, instead of, you know, he could have, in other words, instead of going through all the scenarios of why you got into the position you're in, that person understood when he looked at him and said, man, your sins are forgiven you. In other words, the mess that has been made, the things that you've allowed to ride along and make you sick and even, oh, your body can become very crippled. People, I'm convinced, that has arthritis in the worst way and twisted up is due to unforgiveness. And it pile, it's piled on top because what, once they do it and they set themselves in that kind of uh, flow or vein, they will, it's no matter who speaks to them, if, they, if you say something to them, the least little thing, it's another unforgiveness on top of that one against you. And then if somebody else, the brother says something to them, then it's an unforgiveness. So it's piled on top of pile, on top of pile. This is the way it goes if you let it go. <clears throat> so we need to quickly forgive. Peter said, hey, Jesus, how many times a day should we forgive? He said seven times. He said, oh, Peter, seven times 70, 490 times. I mean, you think... That's pretty much a day's work, <laughs> forgive me. But sometimes we have to make ourselves, it's a good practice. And the best practice is to go immediately and say, I was wrong. I was wrong. My attitude was wrong. I let something get under my skin. I took it out on you and you didn't deserve that. Forgive me, especially family members, husbands and wives. Do not let things go between you. No. Do not let something that's said, you got to begin to communicate. Wives and husbands begin to date, begin to share with one another. Make yourself communicate. Ask yourself why you say the things you do. And you know it's hurting somebody. You know it's hurting your wife. 
You're just like your mother. You're, you just can't do anything right. You burnt the toast yesterday. Now you burn it today. It's that constant nagging because there's so much un, uh, unhappiness. There's so much discontentment running out of you. But when you settle you, with God and you say, I'm going to give excellence to my wife, to my husband, to my children, I'm going to treat my family like my friends and my friends like my family. An old uh, brother Cicchini said that years ago. He told me and my husband, I tell you what, because we he had a house full all the time. And we said, Brother Cicchini, why do you have a house full all the time? And he said, well, you know, we just love people. And he says, people just, uh, we just enjoy helping and loving. And it was a house full of teens all the time. But he said, I learned a long time ago, he said, uh, to treat my family like my friends and my friends like my family. Because he knew that if you really respected a friend, you wasn't going to say anything wrong to him, that you were going to treat him well. And he was talking about treating a friend like David talked about, like Jonathan was a friend to him. He treated him like a brother, like blood of, he, blood of my blood that you had a love for one another and a respect for one another, a love that, that communicates goodness. I'm here for you, friend. A love that says, I'll stand with you through hell, friend, if that's what it takes. A, a love that says that you know that there's nothing that God, and you speak God to them, that nothing that he can't do or straighten out. I'll walk with you. So let us learn to forgive quickly that our spiritual pipes are not clogged up, that we're not caught in, up in something. Now, <clears throat> again, if you want your prayers answered, then you have to, I have to, keep that spiritual communication open and I have to forgive. No matter what the person does, no matter what they say, even if that person shocked you and you thought, oh my God, did I misjudge them? I thought they were my friend. And I mean, you know, uh, David said my closest friends, the ones that put their feet under my table, raised up against me. They hurt me. Now they treat me like I'm an enemy. Even if it comes to that, we have to forgive and love. We have to say that we know and we honor God's word above our feelings. We honor God's word above the, uh, uh, the stresses, above the uh, uncanniness that that caused. Even something very ugly may have come out of it. And you're just, you're just in a daze and a, you can't figure out why. Why would this person drop down to such an ugly place? That's, but you just pray for them, but forgive them and do not let it carry you into ugly places. Because my friend, it can carry you into ugly places. And you know, <clears throat> People, again, you can't let people, there's people that, that know how to use money to uh, influence you. But you can't let money influence you to go to places and to stand in causes and things that you know that is against God's word, that you know is against God's love and forgiveness, that you know that it's not going to build a fortress or that you know it's going to build a fortress of contentment and, and all of these things that it's going to cause you and where it's going to hurt most is you. When people refuse to forgive, it hurts you again because it sets up in your body. It sets up in your mind. It sets up in your emotions, even your decisions. You'll make decisions totally and completely that made no sense 
because you just wanted to hurt somebody or you just wanted to keep that hurtful, ugly thing going. But, but you know what? Receive Jesus. Let his love shine in your heart and forgive. And we see here, I also wanted to, and, and love is action. And there's this story here. <clears throat> Hold on just a minute. There was a woman that came in, and the Pharisees uh, had invited Jesus to dinner, and he was reclining. Now, at that time, uh, reclining at the table, it says. Now, their tables sit on the floor, and they reclined, they reclined on their sides, and under pillows or whatever it might be. Well, this woman had come in behind him. And here she, now this was the home of a Pharisee that invited him in. And his name was Simon. And so this woman come in. It says, the upright, honorable, interesting, good man of the good treasure uh, stored in his heart produces what is upright, honorable, and interestingly good. I still got the wrong one. I'm sorry, sorry. Oh, and it said, uh, one of the Pharisees and Jesus uh, asked Jesus to dine with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the town who was especially wicked, oh, an especially wicked sinner, it said. When she learned that he was reclining at the table, the Pharisee's house brought an alabaster flask of ointment perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And she wiped them with the hairs of her head. Now she leaned, she squatted down at his feet. She was standing behind his feet where he was reclined. And she began to kiss his feet. She began to put the ointment all over his feet and affectionately kiss his feet. And a lot of you out there to say today, well, that's sick sounding. No, it's not. This is the most humble act ever that you could ever do, is to wash someone's feet. And Jesus did that for the disciples. And Peter said, no, no, don't, don't wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I can't wash your feet, you can't be a part of me. He was talking about humility. He was talking about humbleness. And it says, begin to wet his feet with her tears. Now she had to be unloading on from the inside. Have you ever seen anybody just unload the hurt? I believe that it was coming out of her, that her face was covered with tears because she was starting to feel free. She was everything she did for Jesus at that moment, kissing his feet, anointing them. She recognized this man is different. You're, you're different from the Pharisees. You're not like the judging Pharisees that use the law on us and they are, they are way out of line. They're not even doing it themselves. This man cares for people. I need somebody to care for me. I believe that she was saying that. Her spirit was shouting, I need forgiveness. I need my life changed. Who knows if that woman had been raised up and abused and knocked around. What made her so wicked? That people treated her maybe badly all of her life to where she felt like she was nothing but something broke in her more than the alabaster basket. When she began to wipe his feet, she began to cry and weep. And it said, and standing behind him at his feet, what, and now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, Here's the old Pharisee that thinks he is somebody that has, at that moment doesn't have a humble bone in his body, obviously. Invited him, saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, if he knew 
and was really Jesus, and he was really a prophet, then he would know, surely know who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a notorious sinner, a social outcast, and devoted to sin. Oh, well, leave it up to the Pharisee to point the finger, right? The religious people of this world, that's what they do. They point the finger of the do's and don'ts and wills and won'ts, but they won't touch anything themselves. They won't do what is right themselves, but they'll judge every holy thing to say and analyze it, that that's just out of order. If they would, this man is saying, this is just out of order. She's so wicked. She hasn't got one good thing in her. Can you imagine if he was God? Oh my goodness. Where would we be today? But Jesus, relying, said to him, replying, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, teacher, say on, say it. A certain lender of money had, at interest had two debtors. He had to pay interest. One owed him 500 denarii, which I think I looked at was over to 200 and some, $22 or something. And the other was 50 denarii, which was like $22. And when they had no means of paying it, he freely forgave them both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon said, the one I take it for whom he forgave and canceled more. And Jesus said to him, you have decided correctly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? When I came into your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she from the moment I came in has not ceased intermittently to kiss my feet tenderly and caressingly. You did not anoint my head with even cheap, ordinary oil, but she has anointed my feet with the costly, rare perfume that had to cost her, it could have cost her a year's wage. The perfumes of that day were very expensive. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, being many as they are, are forgiven her, because she has loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this? Who even forgives sins? But Jesus said to the woman, your faith today, your faith in you, who you found out that I am, your faith in me, has saved you. Enter into peace. Let it all drop. Let it all go, honey. Lay it at my feet today. I can handle it. You can't. Leave it here with me. Go and be free. Be at peace. Let your life change. Let what you in what entered into you today, you poured out all of that stuff. And you be, you begin, I forgave you. You receive forgiveness. You have a new start. And so I believe that she left a blessed and healthy and, and wonderful, her frame of mind, the joy that took hold of her because you can't spend time with Jesus and, not, and, and be the same. You can't spend time with him and ask him for joy, peace, and love. And really exercise your faith. You won't be the same. When you worship and praise him and thank him for what he's done. You won't leave the same. You won't get up off your knees the same. Because something in you is going to change. 
And in, it, he said, enter into peace and freedom from all the distresses. There you go. Sin causes distresses and ugly experiences. It causes you to do things, to say things. That when you're whole, you won't say and do. People are cutting themselves just to feel. But let me tell you, you go to Jesus and pour out like this woman did. And let Jesus love on you. See, she was pouring out her sin, but he was pouring into her at the same time. His love. Him and his father, they were pouring into her his love. And the, she was feeling such freedom that she had never felt before. Maybe not her whole life. Like I said, she could have, it said she was wicked, that she was devoted to sin. She didn't know any better. She didn't know anything else but sin. We have no idea how kids are raised today, how they're shoved around and pushed around, how wickedly ugly people are that see little babies killed and think nothing of it. Little babies that are coming across that border being raped and torn apart and being thrown over walls as if they're just a piece of junk, a piece of paper. We see people that have, that have no heart in the matter. But you know what? I believe that God can change them. He changed this woman that was devoted to sin and sin. And he can change any one of us. Forgive. Let forgiveness wash all the things away from you. Let God in and push the bad out. Let God into your, your begin to meditate on the word of God. Let him come in and make your mind whole. Where you are stable. And that you make great decisions for your life. That you care about people. You love yourself. Thank you for coming and thank you for listening today. I appreciate it very much. And I pray that you go out today, if there's any unforgiveness, and make it right. So that you can be free. So that your lamp can burn brightly for Jesus. So that the oil will not run out, the anointing. Because you wouldn't let anything stop the flow, the Holy Ghost flow in you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for touching each and every one today. That, Lord, that you reach into them. You know who they are. You know what they've done. But Lord, you are able to forgive men their sins and wash them whiter than snow. That you have, by going to the cross, took all of our sins. You took the slate and washed it clean. It's just they don't know about it. Nobody's told them that Jesus has washed that slate clean. That you can have him. That you can accept him and have a new life. Lord, I thank you that the each and every one watching or that will watch this video will accept you and let all that unforgiveness, all that ugliness to be washed out of them and your new life, the life of Christ, the light, the light that lighteth all men come into them in Jesus' name. Satan, I bind you from hindering in any way, shape, or form, anyone being able to understand this message today or to keep them from uh, walking away saying, it's too hard, I can't do it. I can't forgive that person. Oh, yes, you can. You can do it. Show them Holy Spirit. Don't leave them alone until they make it right. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings to you today. Come back and see me. And, you know, if you want, you can leave a message for me. 
You can let me know how you like this message, if it blessed you. Have a good day, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.